But it really is a pleasure and an honor to be here at Francisco Marroquin. Uh, as I've mentioned to some other groups of students that I've had the opportunity to talk to since I arrived yesterday, this is a very special place. And I, I hope that each and every one of you as students here uh, understand and appreciate it. It's not just the quality of the education that you're receiving, which is of an international caliber by any standard, but the foundational ideas of liberty and property and the dignity and freedom of the individual in a system of competition and impartial rule of law under a constitutionally limited government. Those are the guiding principles that inspired the founding of Francisco Marroquin and which continues to guide its, its curriculum and its purpose and its vision. And uh, uh, this is a unique place. As I've told a number of people here, if I was 40 years younger, I'm obviously dating myself, 40 years younger, uh, I would go back to school, learn Spanish, and apply for a job here. <laughs> and, uh, because there was, there's, there's very few places like this anywhere, uh, and that makes it unique. It stands out not just as a university on these principles in Guatemala or Central America or Latin America or the Western Hemisphere, but literally the world. And uh, that's what makes it a very special place, and I'm honored to be here again. What I want to talk to you about uh, today is that this year is the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ludwig von Mises' very famous book on socialism, uh, published in uh, 1922. And what I will end up at least alluding to, what I consider some of the lessons unlearned. First of all, I think we need to remember that in the, the 20th century was a century dominated by the idea and the ideal of the command economy, the controlled society, uh, of various and sundry forms of collectivism. And the two general forms in the 20th century were, on the one hand, communism, the state owning and controlling the means of production, centrally planning what would get produced, where, how, when, and for what purposes. Uh, and in the example of, and in the institutional instance of the Soviet Union, by a central planning agency in Moscow that had the uh, acronym of GOSPLAN. The other form in the 20th century uh, was fascism and national socialism, or sometimes just known as Nazism. Here the state did not nationalize the means of production as had been done by uh, the Soviet regime in, in uh, Russia, uh, but property remained private on paper. Formally, you were still the owner. But in both Mussolini's Italy and in Hitler's Germany, uh, the government soon enveloped, surrounded uh, all that the private sector did with government controls, commands, uh, price regulations, wage determinations. Uh, and so basically, the entrepreneur businessman was reduced to a enterprise manager, ultimately doing what the government wanted to be done in that enterprise. In other words, socialism with the outward appearance of seemingly still private property when in fact it was just something that didn't exist in reality anymore. The state dominated it. And these were the two forms of central planning of forms. Now before we get into Mises and, and the economics of it, I, I want to emphasize a moment. Well, what did the attempt to have these types of regimes cost humanity? These are the numbers. In the name of building a bright, beautiful, new collectivist future, this was the cost in terms of human lives. The People's Republic of China under Chairman Mao, from 1949 when the communists gained power on mainland China to Mao's death in 1976. It's estimated by Western and Chinese historians, of course their archives and records are still shut, it's still a, formerly a communist country, but it's best estimate that in the name of building the bright, beautiful socialist future, 80 million innocent men, women, and children were killed in the regime. Enemies of the people, enemies of the state, former capitalists who had to be done away with or, and repressed. In the Soviet Union under Lenin, Stalin, and then those who followed Stalin between 1917, the Russian Revolution, and 1991 when the Soviet Union disappeared, 68 million people. And that's a number based upon the partially opened Soviet secret archives for a period of time in the 1990s. National Socialist or Nazi Germany. And it's important, as I said, they too were a socialist regime. 
They were just advocating a national socialism, a race-based socialism, as opposed to the communists in the Soviet Union who talked about an international socialism. And that regime between 1933 and 1945 is estimated to have killed 25 million people. Six million Jews, three million Poles, half a million gypsies, well over 10 million uh, Ukrainians, Russians, Belarusians, other Slavic peoples. Uh, China under Chiang Kai-shek, that's the regime in China before Mao, uh, which was also command-guided, 10 million. Imperial Japan, its war, which also was a collectivist regime, 10 million. And then finally Cambodia under Pol Pot, 1975 to 1979, a little over 2 million. Now, you might ask the question, why do I have this? I mean, 80 million, 68 million, 25 million. That, two million, that's, that's like the miscellaneous column. Why you, why you, in terms of a percentage of a population killed, this was probably the largest mass murder of the 20th century because the entire population of Cambodia before this happened was only six million. So this basically meant that one out of every three people in the country was killed by the communist regime in a mere matter of about three or four years. One, two, three, you're dead. One, two, three, you're dead. One, two, three, you're dead. Why would you be killed? You're wearing glasses. If you wore glasses, it could mean you could read. And the Pol Pot communist regime said if you read glasses, you probably had been educated by the prior colonial regime, the French. You had read French. You had been influenced by evil bourgeois ideas in the French language. Or after the French left, the, the Americans, you had, been, you had learned to read and had read books in English, evil imperialist capitalist American ideas. Better to eliminate all those who had been influenced by the evil capitalist ideas so a new socialist man, not affected by these prior ideas, can be raised and brought up. So they, through killing of one sort or another, killed one third of the population in about three years or so. And to warn others to obey the regime, all those dead bodies would be boiled down in acid into skeletons, and then they would take the skulls and they'd make them into like little pyramid mountains of skulls and put them around the roads to terrify others to just obey the state. That's the human cost of trying to build socialism in the 20th century. But how did this all come about? Well, the, the very short version, given our time constraint, is that in the 19th century, the socialist idea began to take root. And uh, socialism and the socialist idea existed before Karl Marx, by the way. Uh, you can read an early Karl Marx in the early 1840s, and you find Karl Marx criticizing communism. He says it's, not, it's impracticable, it wouldn't be desirable. That's the Marx I like, the anti-communist Marx. If only Marx had not become a Marxist, it would have been wonderful. But uh, he ended up, he ended up being, leaving his native uh, Germany. Uh, long story, he ended up in Paris. And it was in Paris that he met the French socialists. And his later longtime friend and colleague, another uh, German, Frederick Engels, who already was a socialist. So basically, the French socialists and Frederick Engels made Karl Marx a socialist. And then, of course, he and Engels wrote his famous monograph in 1848, uh, The Communist Manifesto. But the idea of all socialists was that capitalism should be done away with, all property should be owned collectively, invariably that meant managed and overseen by the state in the name of the people, and there would be some forms of central planning. The nature of such a planned society may have been controversial, and they might have different views among the socialists, but that was the institutional idea of it. What was hardly ever talked about is that how would a socialist economy be planned? How would you know what to produce, where to produce, when to produce, for whom to produce, with what combinations of resources? Socialists rarely spoke about this. Not even Marx did. In fact, you can read all of Marx and you find almost nothing about what the new socialist society would be like and how it should be organized. Plenty of criticisms of capitalism, obviously. But except for a few places, such as in a monograph he did in 1860, 1875, where he says, well, the social society would expand the investments of the society through planning. There'd be a huge welfare state, 
education, retirement, health insurance. But that's about all he said. In a higher phase of communist society, we find have a utopia of from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. So a critique of capitalism, but virtually nothing about how the socialist society would be organized and managed. So then the Bolshevik Revolution occurred during the First World War uh, in, in imperial, following the abdication of the Tsar in November of 1917. Lenin and his revolutionary Marxist group comes to power and they instituted what was called war communism. A civil war had emerged in Russia. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Lenin's regime did not just come to power without a challenge. There was a very bloody three-year civil war from eight, 1918 to 1921. It's estimated that up to about maybe 10 million people died in that civil war. And um, Lenin's idea was to jump immediately into communism, fight the civil war to win the triumph of the regime through a war communism. And then there were several attempts to introduce communist regimes in Hungary and in the German province of Bavaria. They both were short-lived. And in Germany, in, in the, after the end of the war in 1919, uh, the, the government in Germany, the post-war ger government in Germany, were led by the Socialist Democrats, and they wanted to have a plan to socialize, nationalize German industry, to also form a way to leap into German socialism. That's a propaganda poster at this time. You see Lenin sweeping away the Tsar and the, ro the, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the royalty, uh, sweeping away the priests, because religion is, is, is a way to uh, get people to accept capitalism, and then, of course, sweeping away uh, the, the fat money bag carrying capitalist with his top hat. So in this setting, uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, wrote a, a famous article that became the, the corner element of the book to which I'm referring to, Socialism. He published this article in 1920 called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. And he, he, he made a fundamental and crucial challenge to the socialists. Okay, Mr. Socialist, you've nationalized the means of production. You're centrally planning everything uh, in the society with a central planning agency. How will you know what to produce? How will you know what the people want? How will you know the best and most efficient and rational way to use the scarce resources of society, including the available labor force, which now is under your general centralized command, and do it in a way that would be more successful, more effective, more efficient, more productive than the capitalist system that you've been criticizing for all these years. Under capitalism, what makes the system rational and efficient as Mises said, is there's, there's private property. And with private property, people have the motive and incentive to ask, how can I productively and profitably apply the property at my disposal? Even if it's only your own labor, right? You own yourself. You look for the best and most profitable opportunities to apply yourself to earning a living. Now, in the marketplace, where the means of production are privately owned, People have incentives and motives and opportunities to buy and sell. Someone thinks this is more valuable than something they have. They offer a price for it. The other fellow feels the different way. So prices emerge for land, resources, raw materials, machinery, equipment, capital, the services of labor. And therefore, prices emerge for the factors of production that the businessmen, the entrepreneurs, the enterprisers are able to then compare to what they imagine expectationally hope might be the price that we the consumers would be willing to pay to purchase some good that they could manufacture. And that gives economic direction and rationality, right? Because the entrepreneurs can individually compare the selling price to the variety of input prices and judge, well, would the selling price be greater than the input prices, a profit, or less than the input prices, a loss. Or if it does seem profitable, which way of combining the input factors? More capital, less labor, more labor, less capital. To minimize the costs in getting the product manufactured with the least waste in economic terms. That's how the market works. 
or as Mises said in his book on liberalism, capitalist economic calculation, which alone makes rational production possible, is based on monetary calculation. In the capitalist system, the calculation of a profitability constitutes a guide that indicates to the individual where the enterprise he is operating is being run in the most efficient way. That is the least cost in factors of production. But that's what Mises said was be impossible under socialism. And I know that's a lot of words on the slide. But in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that Mises' argument was, well, you've nationalized the means of production. There's no longer markets, and there's no longer prices. And now you have a dilemma. With nothing to legally buy and sell, of course, there can always be black markets, but there's no, legally nothing to buy and sell. Nobody has incentives to make bids and offers. If people have no incentives to make bids and offers, since nothing can be privately owned to be bought and sold, there's no haggling that is arguing, uh, determining what would be the acceptable agreed upon terms of trade. If there's no agreed upon terms of trade, there's no market prices. If there's no market prices, then how do we know what anything is worth in terms of either the finished goods that could be sold to the consumer or all the factors of production? Is this the most in value terms, most highly valid use for this machinery, for that employment of labor, for the allocation and use of those resources and raw materials? How do we know any of this? We don't. So if you don't know the value of what can be sold to the consumers, since there's no market-based prices for final output, and if there are no markets for the inputs to know what competing entrepreneurs consider the appraised value of those resources to be worth in their lines of production relative to others, how do we know, to use the language of the economist today, the opportunity costs of those scarce resources in their alternative uses so that we not misapply a resource or a factor of production to a use less valuable than some other? How do we know what to produce? With what combination of resources to produce? How much of it to produce? We don't. As Mesa said, the market, the prices of the market are like a compass. But what socialism does is do away with the compass. Imagine that it's the era of the sailing ship. And you don't have the modern methods of navigation. You have nothing but to watch the stars. And the sky is over covered with clouds. And it's nighttime. And the ship has gone away from the visibility of the shore. So you're just in the ocean. And the clouds make it difficult to even know where you are and what direction you're moving in. So how do you know how to steer the vessel? You don't have a compass. You don't have the old-fashioned sextant. You can't see the stars. You don't know where you are, what direction you're moving in, or how to get to where you want to go. That's what Mises says. The abolition of private property and the elimination of prices does to the economic system. For all of the promises of rationality, fairer production, better production, greater output, plenty for the masses, the outcome will be an economic disaster. Instead of economic prosperity, as Mises entitled a later small book of his, all you'd be creating is economic and planned chaos. This caused a firestorm of controversy in Mises' time. This was a challenge to all the hopes and dreams of a, of a generation of, of, of people who believed in the idea, the ideal of socialism, a better world, a juster world, a more productive world, for the production for people rather than production for private profit. And now Mises comes along and says, even if you have the best intentions, I, I assume that you're benevolent. You have no ill motives. You don't want to kill people. You only want to make human life better. Right? You're like angels assigned the role of, of operating the socialist society. But even as angels, you institutionally have done away with those elements without which you cannot rationally do anything and certainly not better than a market economy. That is why Mises made his stark and dramatic statement that the doing away of economic calculation, the use of prices to compare profit and loss, 
means that socialism as an economic system is impossible. Now, Mises greatly influenced the generation of economists. When, in the 1950s, uh, Mises had a dinner given in his honor in New York, one of the people who spoke at the dinner was the well-known Austrian economist, his uh, younger uh, colleague and longtime friend, Friedrich Hayek. And in his talk at this dinner in New York in 1956, Hayek said that Mises' book was a revelation, a revelation to his generation, that it shattered all of their dreams and hopes over they thought socialism would provide. It didn't transform them all at once because it was a bitter medicine to say that that better world that socialism promised was in fact impossible, but that slowly but surely an entire generation was influenced by this. And one of them was Hayek. And Hayek's work complements Mises' work. He built upon it. And therefore, in this context, it's worth reminding ourselves of Hayek's additions and complement and extensions of Mises' argument. And by the way, yes, that, that's me. I'm dating myself. Gee, he's ancient. He must have known Moses. See, he might, 1975. But that was at a conference. I was about your age. I was maybe a year or two older than you. Now, as I like to say, notice, Hayek has turned away and he's covering his ear. No, not that Ebeling person again. Please, please, not that Ebeling person. Hayek's addition and amplification of Mises, which was really a reinforcement of Mises' point about prices, is he said, you know, there's a division of labor in society, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. But besides that, there's a deeper sense of division of knowledge and different types of knowledge. There's textbook knowledge, scientific knowledge. That's what you're learning here. You're assigned readings. You have to do research reports, term papers. You're doing a lot of reading. Textbook knowledge, valuable, essential, crucial. You certainly want, if you have to go to a medical doctor, you certainly would like it if he's gone to a medical school and read a few medical textbooks. Oh, that's how the skeleton works. That's how the nervous system works. Reading books can be very useful. But Hayek's point was there's many other types of knowledge. And one of them is for the particular and localized knowledge of time and place in a specific corner of society. The kind of knowledge that people only acquire and know by being in a particular place at a particular time. The, the, the type of stupid and silly example I try to give, you've graduated. You've gone to your, you've, 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 you've been hired at a new job right out of Francisco Marroquin. It's your first day at the office. And as you enter the office, you're greeted by who? The big boss. And the big boss says, Oh, what are you doing here? Well, uh, uh, I was just hired here. It's, well, and he hands you a document. I'm having an executive meeting in an hour. Make me 20 copies and give it to my secretary. Oh, it's my first day, and the big boss has noticed me. Oh, but now you have a problem. Where's the photocopy machine? Is there anything here at Francisco Marking will have told you where the photocopy machine is kept in that business? Of course not. Someone directs you to the photocopy machine. You put in the originals, you punch in the number of copies you need, you push the start button, nothing happens. You panic. You're looking at the clock. He needs it in less than an hour. Someone comes up, what's wrong, fellow? What's wrong, young man? Well, the big boss, and I can't make it. Oh, it's all over for me. My first day is going to be my last day. You have to know what to do. And he goes up to the photocopy machine and goes like this. And there's some electrical problem inside, but by kicking the right place, the current is connected and out come the copies. Is there anything in Francisco Marroquin that will have told you, A, where's the photocopy machine? B, it's not working on the day that you're, you're assigned this task, your first day, and where to kick it on the side so, so, so the connection is made with the wire inside. Because it may not be until the tomorrow that the repairman comes to fix it or replace it. No. Localized knowledge of time and place. Who are your customers? Who are your rivals? What type of innovations and advertising campaigns are your rivals undertaking? 
What is it that the, your customers are looking for in products in terms of quality, features, and characteristics? If you raise the price, if you lower the price, how much might they buy less? How much might they buy more? You don't learn that in a textbook. You learn supply and demand. You learn that prices move up and down and bring them into, into coordination. But you don't know real supply. You don't learn real demands unless you interact with those with whom with those who are your potential or existing customers. And you have a feel for the market by interacting and working in the market. Then there's a third kind of knowledge, tacit or inarticulate knowledge. I noticed that there is a wall here at the university where you have a, a, a dedicated to, to the memory and ideas of a, of a, a, a Hungarian-British philosopher named Michael Pogliani. Now, Michael Pogliani got interested in this uh, in the 1940s, this idea of knowledge, and uh, he developed a third type of knowledge which Hayek adopted in his own writings, and that is tacit or inarticulate knowledge. The knowledge of what to do, how to do, and where and when to do something, but which is difficult or impossible to fully put into spoken or written words. Y years and years ago, I was watching a, one of those afternoon television talk shows, and you know, they have guests on, and I don't know about here, but around in American television, about every seven or eight minutes, they have a commercial, right? A commercial. So they had someone on the show that day that was sort of talking about this knowledge. And he asked two people to come up from the audience onto the stage. And he had one lie down flat on the stage. And he had the other person stand over him. And he said to the person standing over him, I want you give, to give him detailed and explicit directions how to get up off the floor. You do not do anything other than the specific directions that he gives you to get up off the floor. Now, I think all of us know how to get up off the floor, right? I'm not talking about when you've been drinking too much. I mean, under normal circumstances, all of us know how to get up off the floor. This is not a Nobel Prize task. So, b bend your legs, put your elbows on the floor, tighten your stomach muscles, all the things that you think of, right? Well, that seven or eight minute segment went on until the next commercial. The guy never got off the floor. How do you put these things into words? We all know how to do it. Or even not something as dramatic as that. Your car is not working properly. You take it into the, to, 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 to the, uh, to the garage to, for the mechanic to look at. He says, uh, turn on the engine. And you turn it on. You're, I know what the problem is. I've been working on this kind of car for years. I hear it. You're listening. You can't tell what the hell he's talking about. Uh, come back in an hour. I'll have it running like new. Well, how, how do you know what's wrong? Ah, I've been doing this for years. Don't worry. What's more important? That the mechanic can put into words how he knows what's wrong and what he plans to do or that you come back in an hour and he knows how to do it even though he can't put it into words and you drive away in your car and it's running perfectly. Which is more important? That you come on right away in your car. So people acquire knowledge of how to do things, read situations, interpret situations in ways that may be difficult for everyone or some people to put into detail and explicit written or spoken words, but without which certain things might not be able to get done. Now, Hayek's point is that these are the types of knowledge that people possess. And we don't possess different types of all three. It's not as if you have this kind and I have that kind. We're layered. And we have all three types of knowledge in our minds, in unique, in combinations, in forms, in details, based upon our own life experiences, in our individual corners in which we have grown up and we live and we experience things in the society, in the market. So how do we combine all of this knowledge, which exists in no one place, as Hayek put it, but is decentralized, dispersed, spread out in all of our minds in different and limited specific forms and types? No one of us has all of this knowledge. Hayek's point was, therefore, amplifying and arguing Mises's point, that's the role of the price, the price system. It's through prices that we communicate and talk to each other. It's a shorthand. What do people want? How much would they be willing to pay? What is it that someone else thinks they could produce? What would it cost to buy the resources and raw materials and labor and capital and, and land 
to combine them in different Sunday ways. It's not necessary for all of us to know everyone else. Why do you want that product? What plan or purpose do you have in mind? Who's the, who's the competing businessman who also would like to hire labor, purchase capital, or, uh, rent some sa uh, uh, borrow some savings, rent land? It's not necessary to know everybody else. Everyone can use their own knowledge in their own way that they have in these different forms and just provide information to each other about what they value, what price they're willing to place upon it as a finished commodity or as a resource and input. And those prices are formed in the market and now enable people to combine their little bits of information in shared, coordinated forms with everyone. Now, uh, the American Constitution, I assume it must be in your Constitution as well, in principle uh, uh, recognizes and says we are all to be respected in freedom of speech. Is that true? Now, speech is essential to communicate, right? We share ideas, we tell each other what we think, we compare, our, we compare arguments and, 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 and uh, 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 hypotheses. I have often felt that prices should be covered under the freedom of speech. Because prices are the means by which we talk to each other, not just across the markets of our own countries, but across the world. When governments try to control prices, it's like this. And I want you to remember every word that I just said. <laughs> right? You can't. Right? That's like putting your, putting your hand over someone's mouth. Well, controlling or abolishing prices as socialism attempted to do and would still like to do by, in the eyes of many socialists would be that. It would be preventing people from talking to each other in these simplified shorthand ways that encapsulates di diverse and complex an intricate changing the information and knowledge that is able to be conveyed in simple form to everyone in this global market through the movements of prices. That's the reason why about 10 years after Mises' book on socialism appeared, he said, in so much as money prices of the means of production can be determined only in a social order in which they are privately owned, the proof of the impracticability of socialism necessarily follows. It alone will enable future historians to understand how it came about that the victory of the socialist movement, the idea, did not lead to the creation of the socialist order of society. That is, a prevailing and continuing and successful socialist institutional system. Why the Soviet Union disappeared. Why China ended up changing a large part of its institutions. Et cetera, et cetera. Mises' other point, uh, these are quotes from some short articles of his, but is if you read the book on socialism, his criticism of, of the socialist economy is like the central part, but enveloping it is a critique, a criticism, an analysis of all facets of socialism. Socialism as a political system. Socialism as a sociological system. Socialism as a cultural system. Socialism as influencing international relations among nations. It is comprehensive. And next to his crit criticisms of socialism on all these matters, he explains, and if that doesn't work, the only alternative is the liberal market order. The liberal market order. And what was the importance of the liberal market order. This is captured in, in his, these summary statements. The idea of liberty is and has always been peculiar to the West. It became the essential concern of all Western plans for the establishment of the good society. It begot the laissez-faire philosophy to which mankind owes all the unprecedented achievements of the age of capitalism. The age of capitalism has abolished all vestiges of slavery and serfdom. It has put an end to cruel punishments and done away with torture. It has repealed all privileges and promulgated equality of all men under the law. It has transformed the subjects of tyranny into free citizens. A free hand was given to those who had the ingenuity to develop all the new industries which today render the material conditions of people more satisfactory. Population figures multiplied, and yet the increased population could enjoy a better life than their ancestors. I've mentioned this in a number of other talks that I've given to the students yesterday and earlier today. If we went back to 1820 and asked, what is the world population? It is estimated by population demographers 
that the world population in 1820, 200 years ago, was 1 billion people. They also estimate, as best as they and economic historians can interpret, out of the 1 billion people, 90% lived in poverty. Today, let's say 2020, 200 years later, the world population has increased from 1 billion to 7.7 .7 billion, almost eight times as large. Yet that eight times as large global population has people living in poverty of less than 9%. So 90% of 1 billion, less than 9% of 7.7 .7 billion. A dramatic, unbelievably unprecedented increase in the number of people on this planet Yet the abolition of poverty at the same time this was occurring. That's what Mises means here. Private property also, he emphasized, creates for the individual a sphere in which he is free of the state. It sets limits to the operation of authoritarian rule. It allows other forces to arise side by side with and in opposition to political power. It thus becomes the basis of all those activities that are free from violent interference on the part of the state. It. Private property is the soil in which the seeds of freedom are nurtured and in which the autonomy of the individual and ultimately all intellectual and material progress are rooted. Whoever champions private property champions the preservation of the social bonds that unites mankind, the preservation of culture and civilization. That seems like a really strong and dramatic statement, but it is nonetheless true. What is the ultimate and most fundamental property that you personally own? Yourself. This is your, if you own nothing else, you own yourself. Is that not the basis of the end of slavery? Should another own you and treat you as if it was an object of a tool in his hand to move you about and tell you what to do? No. You are a unique and distinct human, individual human being who should be recognized as an end in himself and to use yourself th through the chosen means to the ends and goals that will give your life purpose and meaning and in your eyes, success. Socialism means the end of that because you no longer own yourself. You are part implicitly of the property under the control and domination of the state. In the free market process, choices and trades are based on the free and voluntary decisions and exchanges and choices of the individuals concerned. It is the voluntary nature of free market exchanges that assures that the transactions are mutually beneficial and involve the liberty of the participants. Government planning inescapably does away with that and makes you under the control and domination of those in political power. It is important to remember that government interference always means either violent action or the threat of such action. Government is, in the last resort, the employment of armed men, of policemen, gendarmes, soldiers, prison guards, and hangmen. The essential feature of government is the enforcement of its decrees by beating, killing, and imprisoning. Oh, those who are asking for more government interference are asking ultimately for more compulsion and less freedom. That is the ultimate thing that Mises is talking about in his book on socialism and the other works for which he is famous. That is the difference in the society. Now, these problems have not gone away. The socialist system in the Soviet Union is gone. China, even though it's formerly a communist dictatorship, has allowed degrees of market activity. Certainly, Eastern Europe, that had been controlled by the Soviet Union in the decades after the Second World War, have all moved themselves in the directions of Western-style market institutions to one degree or another. But the socialist idea is still present among us. One example of this as to why the lesson still to be learned, my subtitle here, is what in America is called the Green New Deal. It is said that we are facing the threat of, of climate change and global warming. If we do nothing, the world is going to end in 12 years. But as I like to say, it's 12 years that keeps moving. 20 years, they were saying 12 years uh, we have left. So it's like a moving 12 years. Even if the earth is going through this cycle, 
and whether human activity is causing it or amplifying it or not. The question is, how do we respond? What institutional setting will enable the most cost efficient and effective adaptation and response while doing it so in rational economic terms? We should be turning to a competitive, market-based, price-driven answers to these questions. Instead, what are these advocates of what in America is called the Green New Deal? They're calling for global central planning to fight climate change. National governments and international organizations must combine their efforts to dictate what technologies will be used, what goods will be produced, and with what resources, in what quantities, of what types, to whom will they be sold, under what prices, where people will live, how they'll be allowed to live, what forms of transportation, what types of jobs, what, and since the, the government is dictating that, also Green New Deal social justice. Well, the government is controlling this, now we'll introduce social equity, basically redistribution of wealth through the transfer of incomes and the determination of incomes by government setting of wages and work conditions. Now, if you read them, it's very disturbing if you understand the Mises Hayek arguments. Because they don't ever approach this from asking, well, how will you know that you're cost efficiently utilizing the scarce resources of the society to meet the ends you have in mind? That you're not wasting, you're not misusing, you're not causing imbalances, you're not resulting in people working and living and consuming things in the wrong combinations, in the wrong places, in the wrong ways. It's as if Mises and Hayek's argument has never been heard or other economists like them. It's just the idea the government will centrally plan and techno technological knowledge and desire is enough. And I can assure you, if that was to be implemented in the way these Green New Dealers, as they call themselves, would want, at the national level and then through global organizations over the entire planet, all that existed in the Soviet Union would be experienced here. I had the chance to travel in the former Soviet Union in its last years. I was doing consulting work on market reform and privatization as they were doing transitioning things already before the whole system collapsed. And I had the opportunity not just to read books, but to see how people lived, how they shopped, how goods were produced, chaos, waste, inefficiency, imbalances, the wrong goods produced in the sense that goods consumers didn't want, too much, of good, uh, too, much of goods that can, uh, too much of goods didn't want, not enough of goods they did want. Shoddy qualities and features, because there was no mind, m a price mechanism to guide through the profit motive. A central planning agency in Moscow dictated how, how much, when, where, with no, with no economic rationality to them. If they succeed, that is the, what we would have experienced for all of us globally. How do you think that would impact your life here in Guatemala if the global planners are dictating all of those types of things for all of us, including yourself? How much political weight would the government of Guatemala have in the global debates of determining the central, global central plan? Your fate would be dictated by the big players and you would be the tail following what they wanted. The United States, Germany, France, Britain, China. Oh, the big players, they have influence in, de in determining such a global central plan. But for a country like Guatemala, don't take it personally, but you're not a big player in the United Nations. I'm not saying you're a no player, but you're a little voice compared to others, and that means your fate will be dictated not by your market demands, your profit opportunities, your, int your place in the global division of labor, of commerce and trade. No, your fate will be dictated by other nations who have more power in the, at the political table of international decision making. But it will have no rhyme and no reason and no rationality of the tri price and market type that Mises and Hayek were arguing. That is the challenge that we face today. 
to fight them, oppose them, demonstrate why they're wrong. In the same way that Mises and Hayek had fought against those earlier Marxist type socialists in the 1920s and 30s and 1940s. Fortunately, they did not triumph back then because of arguments like Mises and Hayek's to a great extent. We need to fight that same fight against the latest version of the central planners. Without, with, so, without such a fight, our fates will involve what Mises was saying, the imposition of force and command and control on each of our lives and the loss of our rights and our property, including control of our own fate and our personal being. But I wanted to just mention one other thing which I forgot to put into a slide, but I think it's pertinent to amplifying what I've just said at the end. Uh, Mises wrote his book in 1922, published in 1922, and then 10 years later in 1932, he issued a revised second edition. And in this revised edition, he wrote a new introduction. At the end of that 1932 introduction to his 1922 book, this is how he, what he said. I know only too well how hopeless it seems to convince impassioned supporters of the socialist idea by logical demonstration that their views are preposterous and absurd. I know too well that they do not want to hear, to see, and above all to think, and that they are open to no argument. But new generations grow up with clear eyes and open minds, and they will approach things from a dispassionate, unprejudiced standpoint, and they will weigh and examine, they will think and act with forethought. It is for them that this book is written. That is why, in the constraints of your time and the other things you have to study, you should try to find a little time to read Mises' book on socialism. It is for them that this book is written. In 1932, he's saying that this book is written for you. You're the next generation that he had hopes and dreams and confidence in with clear eyes and dispassionate minds and willingness to reason and listen to argument and to stop this from continuing because it would mean the end of liberty and prosperity. He wrote that book for you. He said so. Thank you.